Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Whitetail Rendezvous is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, You need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draws are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for GoHunt.com gear shop. Remember, when you become a member of GoHunt.com forward slash Insider, you're going to get a $50 gift card to GoHunt gear shop. What's in the gear shop? The best gear that you can buy for hunting the West. This gear has been field tested by some of the best, and they know what it can do, what it can't do. You're going to get reviews, and you're going to have a selection that is bar none right at the top of the list. Having said that, once you get your gift card, all you have to do is go to GoHunt.com and go to the first page and click on Shop and go have some fun. All in all, if you're hunting out west in 2018, GoHunt.com Insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. Don't ever interview me. Hey, folks, this is Bruce Hutchin, the host and executive producer of Whitetail Rendezvous. And I'm really privileged to have a fellow Coloradan today, and he lives down by Durango. His name is Brandon Waddell. Some people call him Waddle, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But anyway, Brandon is the host of Wilderness Attitude, and, and Brandon definitely does have an attitude. And that. <laughs> we'll get involved in that but folks welcome to the show and brandon welcome to the show thanks for having me bruce i'm really glad to be here i appreciate you reaching out and and having me on thank you for the opportunity you're welcome because i've been watching you since you started one you're from durango area it's hesperus is that how you say it yeah you nailed it hesperus colorado yep it's uh just about 12 miles 13 miles west of durango colorado yep yeah, and that's in oak brush country, isn't it? Uh, we, you know, Hesperus is right on that edge. Um, I mean, we're basically at the southern tip of the Rocky Mountains, it's kind of the gateway to the southwest. And so, I mean, you can go 45 minutes north and be at 12,000 feet pretty quick, or you can go 45 minutes south and you're in the desert water skiing on warm water. So it's... Uh, some refer to it a little bit as the banana belt because you're kind of in the Rockies and you're kind of not. And so, but it's a great place to be. I can tell you that. Well, it's down by the San Juan River too. Is San Juan Farmington and the San Juan River isn't too far away, is it? Yeah, that's 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 a good 60 miles or so south of us, maybe 45. Um, but uh, the San Juan comes out of Navajo Lake, which is the lake I'm referring to. You can go down there and water ski all you want. And of course, the San Juan dumps out in Navajo Lake, and that is gold medal waters. I mean, that is some of the best fly fishing you can get your hands on. Yeah, I agreed. And we used to go down there and stay. What What's the name of the guys? It was Age Motel right there on the San Juan, that little community that's right there. And we caught a lot of trout. Down river from there is a cool place. You know, the canyon down below Navajo Dam has some, has some cool – some cool people, cool scenery, and now they got the wine of the San Juans down there. So, I mean, now you can be down there in fishing land and in wine country, I guess, at the same time. I did not. It's been a few years since I've been down there. I did not realize that. It was, you know, we were drinking beer when we were down there. Right. Well, each to their own flavor, right? That's pretty much it. <laughs> we're digressing, folks, but just a little background. If you've never never traveled in the south western colorado it it's this gorgeous gorgeous country and and uh in the winter time you know it's it's not hot so you can you know just enjoy it there's some beautiful vistas and and mesa verdes down there i mean there's there's history that goes back thousands and thousands of years 
Yeah, Mesa Verde is right, not 30 miles from Hesperus. Um, and then, of course, you got the Million Dollar Highway that goes up out of Durango through Silverton and, and Uray and Ridgeway and cruises around to Telluride and back over into Mancus. Um, it's, it's by far, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm prejudiced because I live in that area, but it is by far the most beautiful scenic drive in the United States, in my opinion. People come from all around the world to come and drive the million dollar loop. And, uh, you know, it gets its name from being, from when they first built that road. Uh, I'd be butchering the date, but it was a long time ago that it cost a million dollars to make that road. And we all know now that that road would probably be a trillion dollars to build. Yeah. It's just, you know, and it follows the Animus River. I mean, it's just gorgeous country. And one thing, if you don't know about uh, Durango, you can kayak right down through town. Yeah, that's kind of cool too, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. we've got it, we've got it all there. I mean, we we have spectacular hunting, amazing fishing. Uh, you can the white water going through town is is great. The white water coming out of Silverton is deathly. Um, you better be at the top of your game to do the upper animus. Um, and we've got ice climbing in Uray where they do the world championships. We we were the first area to host the World Mountain Bike Championships in 91, and we've had it a few more times. I mean, you know, our area is where a lot of people go to train in the outdoors. Um, you know, even even downhill skiers and, and Sean White built a amazing facility up out of Silverton to do his training for a couple of his Olympic Games as well, is my understanding. Um I mean, we, we have everything there, jeeping, camping, hike. I mean, you, it's the ultimate wilderness community. So state of Colorado in the Durango area has a plug that's going to go out to thousands of people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, it doesn't need any help. Outside Magazine, everybody votes, you know, Durango and somewhere in the top five all the time. It's a great place. And we have that amazing train, right? The Durango Narrow Gauge train that goes from Durango to Silverton. I, there's only two of those left in the world. Um, so that's that's pretty cool, too, in its own sense. And then, the and help me with this, Winnie Minooch Wilderness Area is huge. Yeah, the Winnie Minooch is an amazing wilderness area. Um, you know, it's, it's some place that I'll be hunting the goat and the sheep at some point and hopefully preparing myself for Alaska. But I've talked to plenty of people in Alaska that come and hunt the Winnie Minooch, and they say that it's got its own level as well um it's an amazing amazing wilderness there's something for everybody in there and when they think a neat thing about hunting um uh, the mooch what's it what's the nickname for it what do they call it just... uh, maybe some call it the nooch but um i don't know i it's just yeah, anyway it, 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 deser- it deserves its full name because it's that epic that's let's just leave it at that <laughs> so so you're gonna hike you're going to not hike. You're going to take the narrow gauge railway out of out of Durango. You're going to get off one of the trailheads, goes up into Chicago Basin. But so you're east of the Animus, and then you start climbing. I mean, there's no huts. There's no hostels. There's no nothing. Everything you have is in your back, and it is wilderness. It just it, – and the vistas are unbelievable, and, and just, the, just the experience of being in those high alpine basins. Um, is worth the price for mission whether you hunt or not. You know? Oh, ab- yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you if, if you want an epic adventure, you take the train up there, just like you said, and you get up through Chicago Basin, and you go find yourself somewhere to sit, and uh, trust me, you will not be disappointed. It will be hard work to get where you're at. You're talking some good vertical to get there, but um, but it is worth every penny. If you can get up there and watch a few sunrises and sunsets, you can mark something pretty epic off your bucket list. That's for sure. Yeah, and in the lower 48, yeah, you can get up by um, in the Tetons, and there's some there's some wild places. There's no question about it. But um, the Winnie Minooch is is one of those wild places that can't be duplicated. I mean, and it goes on forever. That's it, the other thing about it. It's enormous. It, it I, I I'm sure there's still places in the Winnie Minooch where nobody's ever been. Um, and uh, it never will. Maybe I don't know. It's 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 grand. That's for sure. Yeah. So anyway, there's another shout out for the different things. But <laughs> um, Brandon and I talked about it. One thing 
that he and I both espouse to is real people in real places. And yeah, we're going to talk about hunting and we're going to talk about some of life challenges and, you know, what it takes to be physically fit um, to get into Chicago Basin. I mean, because I wouldn't do that, you know, out of shape. That's for darn sure. So let's just segue into that and let's talk about, um, we're going to give another uh, plug, wilderness athlete, and, and you wanted to lose some weight. And things came together. So tell us that story. Well, I went to Pope, Pope and Young Convention back in Phoenix, uh, closing on about three years ago. Um, and I, you know, I've been building a trucking company and I literally was working really hard for my family and me and building this company. And, and in the, in the meantime, I really lost the aspect of taking care of myself. Um, I found myself at the Pope and Young show. I was entering in a raffle. I sat down with Chris Denham in the booth and talked to him briefly about his products and some of his stuff. And Chris, Chris sat down with me and, and really talked to me and we got really deep really quick because I was really passionate about wanting to find some way, a new level of changing my life, um, my health and, and, and my philosophy on eating and just a lot of different things. And so he sold me. So when all the tickets I bought, I put them all in the wilderness athlete bucket. I didn't spread them out for anything else in this show in the silent auction. I, I put them all in that bucket and I won some 28 day challenges from wilderness athlete. And, uh, I got home and it took me about a month to kind of get it, get it put together and kind of start, you know, sometimes it's hard to start, um, a life change because it wasn't something that I was taking very lightly. Um, so anyway, I did a few 28 day challenges and I lost 35 pounds and, um, and I got after it in the gym and, you know, I found myself the year before in elk season in a bad situation because of my health and my fitness. And so, I really wanted to work hard to get more prepared for the hunting season. And so I did that. I got up every day at four thirty, five o'clock in the morning and I went to the gym and then I'd hurry home and get my kids, take them to school and then go to work. And I did that every day for six months. And, you know, it was amazing the mental transformation I went through during that period of time as well. And when I hit, when I hit my hunting season, it's the best hunting season I've ever had. I was able to arrow a bull and a cow and a buck and a doe and a bear. I mean, I had an epic season. The only thing I get, the only thing I still can't figure out is how to hit a turkey. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it changed my life and, and it's brought me full circle to even having the wilderness attitude podcast. You know, when I was working out after the hunting season, I was still working out outside in the elements and doing some things. And I was always in a wilderness athlete shirt, always, always. Because I just, I was so happy and so proud to be a part of something like that, that I, I always wore their stuff because it really resonated for me and it really meant something to me um, and how it changed my life. And so then the next thing I know, I found out about this train to hunt thing, like before, before Thanksgiving, and I started looking into that and I was like, you know, I'm going to keep training through the winter and I, I want to go to this train to hunt deal. I want to see if I can finish a train to hunt. I didn't have any clue what to expect and so i went in there very humble and and ready to see what i was made of right i mean that's kind of the idea is to go see where you're at in your in your level for your hunting um and and do the competition and see if there's something you can work on to get you prepared for your hunting season and a little bit of a barometer right and so a year to the day, which was pretty crazy, a year to the day that I started my first 28-day challenge was the first Tucson event. Or actually, it was, a, it was in Phoenix, actually, that year. Um, so I went down there and competed, and, and to my surprise, I made the podium. And I got third place, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I had no clue what I was capable of uh, with my new mindset, my new body, my new strength, my new will. And, and I, I'll tell you what, I, I, I can't thank Kevin and it, it wilderness athlete or Chris or, or Courtney or any, any of the team there. They, especially, especially Chris sitting down with me in that booth, having n not known me around the apple, right? And, and he just, he, he spoke to me passionately and that changed my life. I owe so much to him. I can't even express it. I, I don't have enough lifetime to express to him how much it meant to me. Have you had him on the show? 
have had Chris on the show? No, uh, it looks like Chris is coming on maybe here in the next couple of weeks. So um, we've talked we've talked back and forth quite a bit. He's a busy guy. I mean, you know, with Western Hunter, all all this stuff he's got going on, it's it's crazy. He, he's a hard one to lock down. But um, we've had some really good conversations. In fact, this last year, I had hip surgery a little over a year ago in December, so I didn't get to compete and train to hunt this year. And and so I spent my time next to Chris humping that mountain and next to that box, cheering him on and helping him with water and doing anything I could to help him out. And uh, he, he's he's amazing. He For his age, he is a beast. He's a beast. How old is he? Well, let's see. He's in the Super Masters, so he, I, he's over 50. That's all I can tell you. I don't know his exact age, but he's in the Super Masters of Train to Hunt. And, man, I'll tell you what, that guy can grind. I mean, he can grind. And um, I hope that I'm, I hope I'm in the shape he's in in his 50s. I'll tell you that. Well, I'll just give a shout out to Jesse Paulson. And, oh, uh, I should have mentioned Jesse. Yeah. Sorry. I just did. I just did. <laughs> but anyway, I, Jesse and, and a friend of mine, Jerry Kerber, uh, at Fit to Hunt, um, got together. We got together about a year. Well, heck, it'll be two years. And I drew an archery sheep tag here in Colorado. So I went from 230 something to 212. And, um, you know, I spent 22 days above 10,000 feet and climbed my first 14ers looking for sheep. I wasn't climbing a 14er. Right. I was looking for sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's where you're going to go to find sheep, right, Bruce? Holy crazy. Right. But, you know, I'll just give a shout out right now to Jesse. He couldn't have been nicer to me um, through the, you know, nutrition, you know, work and, and everything that they did for me. So uh, you got two guys here, folks, that uh, understand who Wilderness Athlete is, understands what their products can do, and you can transform yourself. And let's stay right here because I'm going to introduce uh, this portion. So you spent a couple bucks, you won a couple bucks, I spent a couple bucks, and they promoted me a couple bucks, and all of a sudden I'm in the wilderness. I'm doing what I want to do. And it gives you confidence. One thing it gave me was confidence because I knew there wasn't anything in Colorado I couldn't handle. I mean, mm. literally. There just, right. there wasn't. There, there, you know, am I going to be the fastest guy up the mountain? Hell no. It ain't going to happen. But will I get up the mountain? Yes. And will I get down the mountain? Yes. As you can attest to yourself, Brandon. And so let's talk about why the bedrock of any hunting season needs to be physical fitness and correct nutrition and we can work it right in together look at you know um a- after my journey in the beginning there with wilderness athlete it became very apparent to me that you you got to be in shape i mean you may not be in the best shape you've ever been in, in your life um we're none of us are 18 anymore or 25 i mean some of you listening may be but um as you grow older it plays a more critical part in in being able to do what you want to do there's times where like for me you know the year before when i got myself in trouble um my mind had full intentions of doing whatever it wanted to do but my body couldn't keep up with where this wanted to go and 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 where i needed to go to to get the interaction with the animals that i desired um as an archery hunter you gotta you gotta make some moves you gotta get yourself in places where you have the opportunity to make your kill. And so for me, if you've got good health and, you, and you're in, in anything you can put into being in better shape, um, anything you can do to eat cleaner, get out of the middle of the store and work the outside, talk to people that raise vegetables and do different things. And hopefully you can put yourself in a place where you're putting lean meat in your freezer, right? Um, and I just think that it's super valuable to have a cleaner body and one that's in better shape because like you mentioned, it, it puts you in a better mindset. It puts you in a different place. It, it, it raises your self-esteem. It raises that confidence level. It, it raises your ability. And let's be honest, this hunting's not getting easier every year. Hunting's getting harder every year because you're one, you're growing older, more, there's more people in the back country and there's, you know, not as much opportunity. Right. So sometimes you got to create that opportunity and hope that then luck follows you. Um, But if you don't, but if you're not in the physical shape and mental clarity to be able to go do some of that, 
then your experiences and some of what you might be able to accomplish, I feel is going to be limited. Yeah. And I, I would echo that because, you know, um, the NFL championship games are coming off and you think of everything that those guys do just to play 60, 60 minutes, mm-hmm. you well, know, and week, the, week after week. Right. I mean, I think yeah. that's the crazy part is the longevity they have to play through as well. Right. I mean, 16 weeks plus plus to get to the Super Bowl. Um, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot of toll on the body. So you got to give your body every chance, every opportunity, every chance. I mean, your body's a machine, but if you're, you're not lubricating it and you're not giving it clean fuel and you're not, you know, and you're not giving it what it needs to be at its best performance, then those are the questions you have to answer later for yourself. Yeah. And he, uh, props to Cameron Hayes. Um, you know, he's taken, uh, his passion, one, uh, for physical fitness, two, for hunting. And 20 years ago, people didn't really know who Cameron Hayes is. His, his, his name was popping up in some magazines. There were some things happening, but then social media, and then he's turning into a brand. But that's, that's something to, to aspire to. Not to, uh, because none of us are going to be Cameron Hayes. It, that's not going to happen. None of us are going to be Aaron Rodgers. Not going to happen. But Brandon Waddell, Bruce Hutchin, we're going to be the best of us that we can be. And that's right. where I think the physical fitness uh, really comes in. And, you know, I've had some bumps and bruises along the way. So it, it it's tough right now. But, you know, I'm going to get back to it um, and, and, and get back in the gym and do the things I can within reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I'm going to start, you know, getting back because it's been almost 90 days. And they didn't want me working out. Till ninety days has gone by, yeah. But you, you know, that's just the way it is. That is but, the way it is. You you got to give it that chance. I mean, you know, I I made that podium, and then my hip deteriorated so fast that I I mean, I was I was literally eating I broke from like a Pez dispenser. And had I probably been able to get my hands on something better than that, I probably would have because I was living my days in pain, a lot of pain. I couldn't walk right. I couldn't I couldn't do anything. Um, I didn't get to go to the national championships, you know, with train to hunt to try to even try to do that. Um, you know, and, and so then I had that hip surgery and it's kind of the same scenario for you being in your act and your rollover, right? I mean, we got to give our bodies time to heal. I mean, I couldn't even walk for a month. I mean, you know, and, and, and the doctor, he, I couldn't lift for eight months. I couldn't, I mean, I was doing PT and some of that PT was tough. It was good. Um, it was great mobility work and good, good, you know, it was great stuff. Um, but I wanted to get back under the steel, right, and, and get back to some strength training. And, and he didn't clear me for eight months. So, you know, you're 90 days out. I mean, it's hard to be patient, right? You want to get back in. You want well, to get back. I'm getting yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I got chubby. There's no doubt about it. You know, I was like, I, I went to some of the trained hunt events this year to encourage some friends and whatnot. And, 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 and reconnect with some of the community and hell i didn't even have a pack on and i was running up and down the mountain and i was gassed because i was way out of shape and i was way fat and uh you know and then even running into willie schmidt last week it was like man you're looking good and i'm like yeah cool thanks because you know he must have seen a difference between you know june and and now which i sure hope people would because i've been working my butt off but um, but, you know, it's not for everybody else. It's for me, right? I mean, we do this for us because we want to be successful. We want to be comfortable. We want to be – I want to be better than I was yesterday. And I think the healthier I've been, the more clearly I've been mentally, and I think it's made me a better father. It's made me a better husband. It's made me a, a better boss. It's it's encouraged and empowered me to be happier and better in every way of my life. You know, I didn't do it just for hunting. You know, I, I did it because I want to be in good enough shape that when I have grandkids, I can get on the floor and I can still get back up. That I got grandkids, if they want to go hunt, I can go. That I can maybe lead them into the mountains somewhere and I might be able to go do their sheep or goat hunt when I'm 60 something years old or 70 years old. And I can still, you know, go with them and they don't have to worry about me or they don't have to carry my stuff or whatever. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's simple. Do it for you, and the rest kind of falls into place, you know. Speaking about, you know, um, helping your grandkids, along the way you've helped, 
there's been some guys that have helped you get into hunting and people brandon started hunting about eight nine years ago and so he had some interesting experiences and then uh, along the way he's met some guys and uh, he's better for it so having said that let's let's tell about uh that story about getting those mentors and what they meant to you well i'll tell you when i the first time i got a bow in my hands tommy romero a good friend of mine who came out to hunt on my property he he shot a really nice deer and um and I just wanted to try this whole bow thing. I mean, I'd shot bows when I was in Boy Scouts, but, you know, they were just those fiberglass bows that I don't think there was a, any consistency to trying to fling an arrow out of any of those, but it was fun to try to hit the big old bale, you know. But but when I first shot his compound bow, I was like, holy cow, like, that is cool. Um, and I was kind of in a place of trying to find some new therapy, if you will. You know, I'd been rolling around on a Harley at triple digits for a long time and, and going fast because I have a, I have a problem with speed. Um, and, um, but I needed a different place to, to turn the world off. And I really figured out that, man, if you're not in your moment in archery and you're not with each arrow and every time you draw your bow, if you're not in that moment tuning out the rest of the world, then you're not going to shoot real well. And so. I end up figuring out that it was a great place for me just to have quiet time, if you will, and time where I can block out the world and just be in my little space and my little moment. But then I realized that maybe I'd like to hunt with this thing. And so I surrounded myself with a few key people, um, Blue Webb, John Gardner, Dennis Howell, Tommy Romero, um, my nephew, Jacob Gonzalez, um, you know, people that have all been hunting a really long time. Um, when I first met Dennis Howell, I never really knew a whole lot about him. But then when I walked into his man shed and started looking around, I'm like, I don't know how many times he's been on the cover of Bowhunter magazine and how many elk he's killed in his life and how many mules he's killed in his life. I mean, uh, I think he's lived in Colorado 22 years, and I think he's killed a bull 20 out of those 22 years. Um, and same with his muley hunts, you know. And then Lou Webb is a great guy. He's a, he's a longbow shooter real naturalist you know and um just just as pure as they come in the archery form right and and so he you know he taught me some of that just being in the woods hunting you know that stealthiness and just being patient and becoming one with the forest and slowing down and you know using your senses and and being a part of things and um you know and along with everybody i mentioned they all gave they all hand me down something i mean i'll hunt with anybody at least once um to try to shadow them if you will you know just watch them there's so much you can learn if you just watch people hunt especially experienced hunters they there's things they'll never say to you things they'll never specifically tell you but if you can watch their body language and watch how they move through the wilderness and and how they react and i mean it's it's awesome um you know dennis spent a lot of time in the garage teaching me how to bugle I mean, we'd, we'd have full on conversations like we were elk on each end of the shop and, and he'd yell at me, no, no, that's, that's not how you do it. Listen to me again, you know? So then he, and then we, we tried to have conversations without talking to each other, but then that has to be like, no, that's, that doesn't work in this scenario. You can't do that. The bull just left. So you try this. Um, and what's cool was they all gave me a lot of instruction. They all gave me a lot of things, but then they would push me out and say, go. Go hunt, go hunt. And I'll be like, well, take me hunting. No, no, I'm not taking you hunting. You go, go hunt. And I would go hunt, you know, 80% of the archery season. And then I'd call them up and they, they, or they'd call me and be like, okay, tell me about your hunt. I'm telling this, tell them that. This is what I did. This is how I beagle. This is how I cow call. This is where I sat. This is where I, I mean, I just dissect my hunts and tell them all about it. And, uh, and then they'd say, okay, okay, go try this. In this instance, try this. In this instance, try that. Now go go again right and so um you know like lou i talked to lou a lot throughout uh, i don't know it was this, this four years ago i guess in my elk hunt and and he's like you're doing the right things just keep after it just be confident do you know change this tweak that keep going keep going and then finally the last week of the season it was i just i'd had some encounters i, I should have had an elk i didn't have confidence in my shooting to shoot 42 yards um on a on a good bull uh, i kept thinking i had to be closer and closer and closer and and you know lou being a longbow guy he'd be like you got training wheels i've seen you shoot just shoot <laughs> you gotta 
have some confidence. Let it go. Let it fly. I know. I've seen you shoot. You can shoot an elk at 42 yards. I'm positive you can. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. I, I think I need to be about 22. And he's like, Brandon, you know, get some confidence. And so, I mean, I hunted four years for elk before I got my first elk. And, um, and finally Lou says, okay, come to my house. So I went to his house and we went out and about. And he says, I want you to go here and I want you to go there. And I want you to cow call over there and I want you to get ready. And I went up there and I cow called and I cow called this, this bull in from about a half a mile away and he came into 12 yards and he gave me that shot. You know, <laughs> so, um, but you know, since, the, since my first bull, I mean, I just, sometimes you just need to, you know, I don't know, from a lack of a better term, pop your cherry, right? And then, and then you're good to go. Like you, you got this confidence, like you can do it. Like I was able to quarter my first elk and, and pack it out and do a few things and and it was you know I look back on some of that and I you can't you can't replace mentoring somebody um it's the most joy you ever get in your life you know and and now I'm in in the last few years now I'm in a position where now I'm passing down everything I've learned to my kids and and uh, my kids have killed more animals than I have in the last two years hands down they're feeding my family better than I am right now and um and you, you can that's what this is all about right this is what it's about it's about learning growing sharing passing down what you're learning passing down what you know whether it was good or bad or ugly teaching the younger generations to come up underneath you and be hunters provide for themselves have some idea of what it is to be somewhat self-sufficient in this crazy world right um and uh i i just I, I can't say enough about, I, I'm sure I'm leaving people out. Um, I mean, social media has helped me. I mean, when I first got in it, I read every magazine. I read every article. I listened to every podcast. I, I was, I was, I, I mean, I'm an archery geek. I, I, I shoot every arrow, every bow, every broadhead. I mean, everything I can get my hands on. I, I got into the local archery shop and I was just like, figured out a way to make myself family and an unpaid employee so that I could just soak it all up, man, you know? And and just and try to do whatever I could to to be better. Folks, you've heard a couple of different things. One, um, we didn't talk about whitetail. We talked about elk, but it doesn't matter if you're looking to get become an uh, archery uh, whitetail hunter. Then there's people around you, whether you're in North Dakota or Kansas, it really doesn't matter. That will help you if 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 you meet them three quarters of the way. They're not going to do it for you, as you've heard. Brandon say, you know, he had to go out and get pounded and, you know, and, and keep making mistakes, making mistakes, making mistakes. That made him better. He didn't realize it at the time, but it made him a hell of a lot better because then he'd come back and listen to the, the quiet eight, his guys, and then it makes sense. He's like, oh, yeah. Okay. I did that. That didn't work, but here's why it didn't work. And the same thing with archery, uh, whitetail hunting. Uh, you know, we have more and more people. I just read an article. Uh, in the Milwaukee Journal today that for the first time ever, crossbows have superseded compounds in, in harvesting whitetails. And a couple of reasons for that, one, because kids can do it. Two, disabled people can do it. Uh, women can, can do it a lot easier. They can shoot a, comp, uh, a crossbow a lot easier than a compound. They're just they're easier to shoot. There's no question about it. But you still have to be a hunter. I've had this conversation in many, many um Bars in Wisconsin, oh, you shoot a crossbow. <laughs> yeah, I shoot an Excalibur crossbow. But that doesn't change. I can go to the same stand you have, and the deer still has to come by. It, it doesn't change anything how you are as a hunter. It just gives you a better opportunity, I think, uh, if you practice with it, to, you know, to, to harvest the game, to kill the game. But, you know, just apply what, what Brandon said and, and look around because there's guys right in your neighborhood that are really good, but you'll never know who, that they're really good. That's right. You have to find them and then be sincere enough to say, okay, how do you do this? How do you take the best buck in the river Valley every single year? And they're not going to tell you today. <laughs> they're not going to tell you today. No, so don't not. get disappointed. <laughs> don't get disappointed. But over the months and years, yeah, this, this, you'll have an opportunity to learn. And if you learn, then your day will come. That's right. I, you know, and 
I think the biggest thing when you're going to learn from these people is you check your ego at the door. Um, you know, you got to go in there humble, teachable, and, and you know, and, and you got to try new things that they tell you to do. If you're not willing to change your setup or change your gig or change how you call or do different things, then they're, you know, if you're not going to give three weeks to four weeks for the change to settle in and how you hold your bow or maybe how you, what release you use or whatever, if you're not willing to, to give it a chance, then most of these guys are just going to be like, well, then just, then just go do it your way. You know, um, so, you know, you always, I just think that you always got to show them the respect and, and, and go push yourself, go try. You got to try. If you're not trying and you're not putting it out there, then, you know, then they're not going to teach you. And I think that when you really put the hard effort in and you really, and you're really eager and sincere about what you're trying to learn and what you're trying to do, they'll recognize that and they'll help you out. Um, and then, you know, these, a lot of these guys are quiet, you know, I mean, even some of the guys that I've interviewed on the podcast from Pope and Young, I mean, these guys, they are not egotistical. They are quiet. I mean, you got guys that have done a sheep lamb three times. And if you ask them how many times they've done it, they're not going to tell you three times. They're just going to tell you, well, I've done it a few times. You know, they are always humble and downplay their, you know, their, their accolades. They're, they're what I call the quiet giants of the industry, right? They're not, they're not, you know, they're writing good articles for people's magazines, doing some things like that. But very rarely do you see them on the cover of something. Very rarely do you see them, you know, playing the Hollywood style of, of the industry. Um, and, and those people mean a lot to me. Those people, those, they're, they attract me, you know, big time. Um, and, yeah, it doesn't matter what you're hunting, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what you're using. Get out in the wilderness and give it a shot. Own your craft. Be your best. You, the animal deserves that. For you to be as good as you possibly can be and you know it doesn't matter you still got to find an animal you still got to hunt you still got to play the wind you still have to execute the shot you there's lots of involved i mean technology is going crazy in the industry right now right and there's a lot of subtle butt going around in different uh, different things that you know not a primitive situation anymore but um you still got to get in there you still got to make it happen i mean if you're shooting any kind of stick and string regardless of whether it's got training wheels or not, or it's, you know, vertical or horizontal, don't matter. You, you got to go out there and hunt. You, you still have to do your part. Yeah. Um, well said. Have you ever had Jim Willems on your, um, show? Um, Jim has dodged me a few times. In fact, he lives <laughs> in Farmington, New Mexico. Right. And, uh, right. Right. Um, you know, he, he's, he, he's real close and I run into him a lot and, and I keep asking him and, and he tells me, he tells me anytime, basically. Let's just put it that way. He tells me anytime you want, anytime you want to have me on, I'm on. Um, but then you call him and you try to get into his schedule, and that is crazy. I mean, that you want to talk about a guy who's linked in this industry and doing a lot of good work for it. Um, you know, between Pope and Young and um, Four Corners SDI and CBA and um, Good Lord, I I I, could, I I don't know how many groups he's involved in and and plus committees he's on and and everything he's. He's a busy guy. Plus, he's trying to hunt. You know, I mean, I just, I just saw him, and we both had a New Mexico tag, archery tag, in the beginning of January, and he told me to call him sometime about this week, and and we'd finally get it penciled in and get it done. So hopefully, hopefully, folks, uh, Jim Willens is the president of Pope and Young, and right. I've been fortunate to have him on on the show, and he's a great guest, and and he's one of these guys that, as Brandon just said. He, what he's done with traditional archery gears, just, you know, you'd go no way. Not one person could have, couldn't have done what he's done. Well, he's done it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, between Lou and some of these guys that are, that are in, in John Gardner, Jim Willems, I mean, these guys are total traditional guys and they, they keep trying to talk me into going back to a trad bow. And man, I don't know if I want to, I'm not sure if I want to go through those, those, I, I just remember all too well those first four years of hunting and never killing nothing. And it was so defeating that I don't know if I'm mentally ready to go back to a place like that again. I, I, I'm enjoying my training wheel success at this point, and, and I'm going to ride that out a little further. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in your, your buddy's camp and, and just say, you know how to hunt now. And there's guys, uh, I think of uh, Marv Clanky, uh, you know, exceptional exceptional traditional you know archer 
and that's all he's hunted with. And, you know, he said, Bruce, it's, it's about patience. It's about hunting. And I don't care what you have in your hand. You know, if you practice with it, you, you're going to get the deal done. And it that's doesn't right. matter. Yeah. Are you going to shoot 42 yards with a stick and a string? You know, uh, probably not. But <laughs> probably not. But then just think of the rush when you have that bull over your shoulder at 22 yards. Well, that's exciting. That's yeah, exciting. That's- Exciting, man. I mean, exciting. you know, I have yet to get a bull as close as 12 yards again, like my first one. And, um, I'll, you know, Dallas Smith, I had on the podcast early in April, and he, everything he said to me resonated. I mean, and I'll tell you what, when a bull comes in and he's close to you and he screams, fire, I mean, it, I'm getting chicken skin right now just thinking about it, man. It's, it's one, of, it's, you know, and it, it's, it's one of my favorite things because obviously we have, you know, we're very fortunate to have the amount of numbers we have of elk in Colorado. And, um, I mean, I can, I'm super lucky. I can be 35 minutes from my house and I'm in a honey hole with elk. And, uh, so it's hard not to want to do that. But, I, I, but I'll tell you what, I, I give a shout out to all the whitetail guys, man. I mean, you know, I've had people say to me, Oh, well, what? There's nothing to that. They just go sit in a stand and they just this and that. And I'm like, man, you know, in the elk woods, you can move, you can make noise, you can do all this stuff and still get close to elk. There, there, there's a certain amount of grit and a certain amount of patience that comes with whitetail hunting that I'm not sure I have because I can't sit in a tree stand all day. I can't wait for that opportunity to walk by. I, I like to stalk stuff, spot and stalk and chase things and do that kind of, I, I've, I'm way more ADD than I ever thought I was until I got into hunting. And then I realized that, that maybe that's a real deal, you know, this ADD kid. Cause I, I like chasing squirrels and rabbits. I'd like the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. So, um, so I give a shout out to a lot of those whitetail guys. I, I don't know how they, how they do it sometimes. I mean, they're so smart. Um, I mean, I think all the animals in the wilderness have a connection and a, and a sixth sense, if you will. But I think whitetail are like, the rain man of big game, right? I mean, they just, they're, they're off the chart connected. It's like, even if something, a leaf's out of place, they know it, you know? Truth. I mean, that everything you said is truth and they can do magic tricks on 40 acres. No, you and I <laughs> both live in Colorado. 40 acres is nothing. <laughs> nope. Is absolutely positively nothing. Well, I mean, I just try to hunt mule deer on my 40 acres, and that's 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 a challenge in itself too. But I couldn't imagine whitetail. I mean, they're just a whole nother level of hunting that I've never had the experience of doing. But hopefully, here in the next couple of years, I'm gonna get that opportunity. And I really look forward to the challenge, and and I really look forward to just learning the animals and being in their presence. And um, you know, at this point, if I can sit in a tree stand all day and I can watch a good eight point walk by at 100 yards and I actually get to see him. And maybe hear him grunt or something. I'll, that would be success for me. <laughs> uh, Dan Johns would say with Nine Feet of Chronicles, he stayed because he hunts run and gun. So he sees that this is a perfect, perfect little illustration. So he sees that buck at a hundred yards, right on a ridge tarp, and he's 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 rutting, he's grunting, and he's doing whatever he's going to do. So then he'll spin up and he'll put a tree stand in there at you know uh, noontime. Right. And he'll go back that evening and hunt it. And he'll hunt it for two or three times. Either deer comes through and he gets it or not. So that's being adaptive, and that's no different than you what to do with um, elk hunting. You, right. You true. see that bull. You see the water hold. You see the scrapes. You see all the sign is similar. You know what you want is those smoking hot, you know, um, uh, pellets. You know, they're right. Uh, you want the green ones in this squish, and they're hot. Then you put them on your boots and everything. Because you know you're in literally hundreds of yards of a you know of a live breathing elk. Right. I like I like listening to the stories of whitetail guys where they like they put a stand over here and then the deer walks under where they were and then so they put the stand back over here and then the deer walks over <laughs> and they're just constantly moving their stand around because the deer like they always a, a, a day behind. They know. The, yeah. The they pattern, know. You know. Yeah. They, it's they, just crazy. They entirely know. I remember the first time long time ago that I hunted out west and we hunted with an outfitter out here in Colorado and we were all from Wisconsin, drove out from Wisconsin he says, I love having you Wisconsin boys here, and we were out here hunting 
And we go, why? He says, you understand how to hunt elk. I've never hunted elk. <laughs> you know, right. he said, but you understand the patience and, you know, how to look. Just like you were saying, you know, how to move through the forest, how to look and, and see things that are there when you can't see them there. I mean, all these all these different things. And and I always remembered that because the traits that we learned, if we were a successful whitetail hunter, then if you applied them out west, you had a really good chance of seeing elk. I'm not saying killing elk. Yep. I, I I'm think, saying seeing I elk. I think you're right. I mean, whitetail hunters are, are some of the top, right? And then... If they can come out west, I think that you know, to circle back, just if you're coming out west and you're going to start jumping from a thousand feet to nine thousand feet, ten thousand hunting elk, then that's where we circle back to the idea that you better be in a little better shape, right? And you got to have your, you got to have a little bit of a game plan in that area, um, it, it, or at least have a few days to acclimate before you just get after it. So, it, otherwise, I think as far as hunting ability and techniques and and different things, they definitely have it figured out to be able to hunt, come and hunt elk. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, because you read, the, you actually read the sign, and it's it's larger because we're talking hundreds of acres, thousands of acres, rather than you know the forty acres. Exactly. But the sign's still there. If the elk are there now, if there's no elk, there's no sign. Guess what? There ain't no elk. Then go. I, I, <laughs> get out know, of there. That, that was one of the first things that these guys taught me is like, if you get somewhere and you're not in fresh sign, then get out of there. Go somewhere else. You know, it don't matter if you go to 10 places in five days. Don't stop until you're in fresh elk sign. Just because you you just go march around the woods with your bow. You know, I mean, go figure it out right from the beginning, right? But that's what they taught me over four years is how to hunt smarter, not harder. You know, and that's 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 what a good mentor does for you. He doesn't do it for you. He lets you learn the hard way, and then he slowly teaches you how to be the best. Yeah, but and, and white tail hunters, think about what he just said. So you don't see any sign. You see old sign. You see sign that's left a rub that's been there for five years, but they're just not there. Why? Because the food has changed. Why? Because the water has changed. Why? Because uh, there was a forest fire. You know, the gazillion different things. They just cut a new road through. All these things impact where those whitetails are going to be. And if you go back to the same stand that Uncle John shot at 20 bucks in a row and, you know, sit it, likely that it's not going to produce because they change. Yeah, their corridors or travel corridors change all the time for, like you said, multiple reasons. You know, weather, moisture, food, uh, development, um, you know, pressure. There's lots of factors that go into how this changes. I mean, I have never found the same success year after year after year in the same hole. There's always been a variance of success in in each spot. Um, so I always like to think that you should always have, you know, a repertoire of places to be. And you got to spend your summer scouting and figuring out which of your repertoire is going to play out this year. Because whether we, you know, for us in the high country, whether we've had a lot of rain or not much rain or, you know, is the food really green at 12.5 or is it at 10? Did the acorns get uh, frozen this year so there's no acorns? Um, you know, it, it just changes all of their movement. I mean, for instance, we don't have much snow this year. We have a very poor snow. And uh, we usually get a few late deprivation tags out where I live for my kids to get their feet wet and hunt an elk, right? And we haven't seen any elk until the first of January down low. They literally have not pulled off the mountain. I spoke with a biologist that works for Southern Ute and they them elk did their normal time frame and migrated down and they realized that it was dry. There was nothing down there. They went back up to twelve thousand feet on the Continental Divide and stayed there until close to Christmas. And they didn't come down. There was Purgatory Ski Resort there outside of Durango north of us, right? They've been skiing on two or three runs of man-made snow with a little bit of dusting of some nature snow. And just two weekends ago, the majority of the elk came off the hill and went across through purgatory and destroyed the ski runs because they just now came down. Um, and so just the first year in nine years that I didn't have a cow in one of those deprivation tags even killed in October or November or December. Um, and we just now got a couple in the last, six, seven days um, because they finally came through. 
So it's every year it's different. You got to figure it out. You got to adapt. There's nothing set in stone when it comes to hunting any North American animal, in my opinion. So one thing uh, Brandon just said, um, and I call it game plan. And whether you're hunting out west or you're hunting the Midwestern states, you got to have a game plan. If this happens, then I need to be here. And the only way they can do that is you've been boots on the ground. You know, okay, typically. If this is set up, they should be here, 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 three places or five places. Mm-hmm. And you know that. And it's the same thing with whitetails. If, if we have a really hard forest early, that's going to kill the acorns. It's going to put the crops differently. And you, you have to be prepared. That's one thing that just drives me crazy, even with my own crew in Wisconsin. They do the same thing year in, year out, year in, year out. <laughs> they yeah, go, it's, they it's the definition it's the definition of insanity. You can't go to the same camp every year and expect to get the same result. But it's, they've killed deer. I mean, yeah. you know, they've killed deer. And they look at me and they said, why are you doing that? I said, one, I don't want to kill the deer that you're killing. I said, kill them all. I don't, I don't, you know, whatever you want to kill, kill. You know, I'm after a specific age class of deer and I have to do completely different than what we did before. Well, well, how came you're doing that? Because I want to. Yeah, because that's my choice as a hunter. Yeah, right. Because I want to. That's you know. right. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm by no means. Uh, when it comes to elk and 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 mule deer, I mean, I'm a little pickier on mule deer. I have to say because we got a lot of good mule deer, so you can take a little bit of time, and we've got good numbers, and so I don't usually shoot the first mule deer I see. But when it comes to elk, um, I don't know how many times if I call if I call an illegal bull. And it gives me a, a forty yard shot. I'm taking it. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna ta- I'm gonna make the shot. Um, a lot of guys they're shooting for them real mature, super big, like this guy right here, right? You know, um, you know they're looking for that that top notch bull that's very mature and and has done his part, right? Um, but man, I, I'm a carnivore. I, I like to eat, and you know I raised nine children. And I still have four at home and they, and they're all carnivores too. And <laughs> so, you know, I, I shoot the first bull elk. It gives me first legal bull elk. It gives me a shot. I try to make the shot. I don't hesitate. Um, I just figure someday I'm going to call in this guy. You know, someday he'll be the one that presents me that shot. But until then, man, I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to hunt and I'm going to harvest and I'm going to eat and I'm going to, and I'm gonna make memories, and I'm gonna have a good time. And and I don't, I don't care if it's on the first day of season or the last day of season. It's all good with me. It's not, it's not easy to kill an elk. I mean, we only have an 11 percent success rate over the counter archery bull tag in Colorado. 11 percent. So I don't know how people can be picky. You know, this is me. <laughs> You know, and we're gonna wrap, we're gonna wrap up the show with what you just said. You know, and I'm gonna put. You know, it's about yourself but it's about having fun it's about the experience it's about the adventure it's about just sitting there and watching the sun come up and watching the sun cool down and you haven't i've sat in basins the whole day and just watched and it's amazing what you can see but when you think of that i mean there's no video in the world of pursuit or sportsman channel or anything can touch that absolutely none it doesn't it doesn't exist because you can't capture that that event you can try to you know but you can't capture it so it's all about the fun you know that we're imparting and you know that you look forward to and 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 sharing it and all those type of things but that's what hunting is it's a tradition that we own it's ours it's a tradition and it's also some rights to do it ethically you know and morally and all those uh things that we've got to make sure our house is in order there um and having said that you know, it's about it's about the adventure. I haven't killed an elk in a long time, and I've been in some wonderful mountains. And I just I haven't closed the deal. I'm, you know, luck is kind of catching up to me or whatever. Right. But but it's still good because now, just like sitting on that basin, it's just like, are you kidding me? Right. You know how grand is this? Right. Yeah. You you can't you can't. I was with a guy from Chicago. And he had come out with a friend, and I said, "Now oh, we'll go up here and there and 
blah, blah, blah. So we climb up to about 10, 5, 11,000 feet and break out of the timber. And there is Mount Scorpius. And then you can see the maroon bells. I mean, you can see everything, dusted in right. snow. I said, I can guarantee you, nobody from Chicago, Illinois has ever stood where you're standing. That. That's right. And you seen that. Yep. That's a fact. I, um, you know, you can watch all the shows you want. You can, I mean, even the best cinematographers cannot, cannot replace what you can see with your own two eyes and hear with your own ears and smell with your own nose. And, and then also having gone there with your own two feet. N- no one can, no one can do that for you. Right. So, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta get out there. You gotta get in the wilderness. You gotta get off the couch, disconnect, find a way, reach out. There's people locally that'll help you. Like you said earlier, your pro shop. I mean, join a local sportsman club, anything. You know, I encourage people to do something very small locally, get involved in your state archery or state whatever, and then do something nationally. Or if you have a passion for a certain animal, go out there and find it. Uh, join that club, but reach out. Get out, go do it, find that for yourself, and don't be afraid. You can do it. Well said. And how do people reach out to you if they want to ask you a question, Brandon? You can email me at wildernessattitude at gmail dot com. Just and or you can go to the website and there's a link there to connect with us as well. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Wilderness Attitude Podcast. Same with Facebook. Anywhere in there, you can DM me a message, send me a request. You know, we we're on a daily. We we love interacting with people. So if you have any questions about Colorado, you have any questions about me, anything, I'm I'm a very open, very transparent, very humble, very honest person. I love to talk to people. If I don't have your answer, I will find someone who has your answer and I will definitely get it to you. Thanks for that. This is Bruce Hudson, the host of Whitetail Rondo. Reach out to me at whitetailrondo at gmail.com. Listen to my uh, podcast at whitetailrondo. Uh, dot com and on behalf of thousands of people that are going to listen to the show brandon waddell thank you so much sir for taking your time and, and sharing some insider tips well i hope it's helpful to somebody but thanks for having me on bruce i really appreciate it it's it's really a pleasure to get to know you and and follow you and you're an inspiration for me and my podcast thanks so much for paving the way for some of us you're welcome Next up, we're heading out to Utah. Ogden, Utah is the home base for Elite Outfitting Utah with Nick Taylor. And Nick loves taking people out and uh, with a stick and a string. And it starts uh, middle of August and goes to the uh, middle of September. But uh, he's got trail cameras out, and tree stands, and ground blinds. This is all for hunting elk, folks. And so he gets away. He does hunt uh, national forest public lands, but his success ratio is pretty darn good. So listen, take some tips, uh, give Nick a call. If you just get questions about hunting the West, because I know a lot of my listeners want to come out here and mix it up with those big elk. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Nick Taylor, elite outfitter. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.